Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I have another great interview with you. Dr. Nakisha Hammond, she's a dear friend of mine. We've been working together for almost a year now. Um, I'm continually amazed at the people that I have the privilege of working for and with, and they always have something really interesting to add. And so, uh, Doc, why don't you give us a brief rundown of sort of your experience and like uh, where you're well known, and then we'll get into the interview. For sure. And thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. As you know, um, <laughs> I'm Dr. Nikisha Hammond. I am a psychologist, executive coach, speaker, and author. I have been in private practice now for about 15 years. Feels like just yesterday. Uh, but I, I specialize in ADHD and over the last couple of years have been starting to specialize in burnout prevention for different communities and different groups. Um, so it's been an incredible ride and experience in the mental health field. And I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. That's so what what was the beginning of sort of um, the ADHD world? And really, I'm trying to think about it from the perspective of feel good fathers. And some of us are going to have kids, uh, kids that have ADHD. Some of us are going to have kids that have a lot of energy. And so I think from two perspectives, I would love to understand sort of like your historical reason for doing that. And then the second thing is like what to look out for um, as a feel good father. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Uh, so I was originally drawn to ADHD way, way in the back in the beginning of my career because, well, first of all, it's it's very overdiagnosed, unfortunately, because a lot of what we see as attention issues, especially for kids, society automatically wants to go, oh, it's ADHD, um, which is not always ADHD. It can be a lot of other things. So as I started specializing in comprehensive psychological um, evaluations, what I started to see was that, well, first of all, like I mentioned, not every kid had ADHD and a lot of attention issues can be due to depression. It could be anxiety. It could be trauma. It could be learning disabilities and like 10 other things, right? It could be a physical health issue. So there's a lot of things, as you mentioned, to look out for. Mm -hmm. Yes, a child might have issues with extra energy. Yes, they may have issues with attention issues in their classroom, um, but it, it really needs a, a comprehensive look at physically, how are they doing? Emotionally, how are they doing? Socially, how are they doing? Uh, COVID just happened, the COVID pandemic a couple years ago, which completely changed the dynamics of a lot of families, mm -hmm. a lot of parents, a lot of parenting, a lot of education systems were just, you know, struggling. Um, so, so a lot of things really have to be looked at when it comes to kids to really determine, do they even have ADHD? And if they did, like, here's a couple of things that we can do to help them with the process of recovery. I think that most, most folks are going to go to like a general practitioner, like their, their local GP for that diagnosis is, and I'm not trying to throw shade or anything like that, but just, I want to mm -hmm. get some, like some clarity. Yeah. Should the feel good father, should they be going to the GP? Should they be going to... Or should they be looking for a specialist to kind of get these diagnoses? Because if I'm evaluating the fact that there are, I think in my head, when you said comprehensive, there's like a bunch of different things that you said. Yep. I was like, oh, oh, that's a lot of specializations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so I, I am a fan of starting with a pediatrician. I actually uh, wrote that in my last book for ADHD. Start with a pediatrician because there's also physical health things. It could be low blood sugar. It could be... Uh, I mean, it could be diabetes, it could be low iron, like there's a ton of different things that could look like ADHD. So I am a fan of starting with the pediatrician, but generally depending on the physician's office, which I don't fully agree with, generally there's two forms. There's a form for the parent and there's a form for the teacher that says, does this child have ADHD or not? So the forms are filled out and then a pediatrician might say, yep, you have it or no, you don't, or yep, you have it and here's some medication and hope for the best. I'm, Here is the I, problem with this. Sorry, I'm, un, yeah. I'm unclear. Yeah. What what forms? What do you, I don't understand. Yeah, there's there's forms to fill out. So there'll be forms to assess for ADHD where the parent will fill out this long form asking about different behaviors, how are they doing at home, and then the teacher will fill out a similar set of well, teach and ver teacher version of the form where they'll, you know, it's a, it's like a checklist basically of how is this child doing with their behaviors, which is important it is important to look at those things, but the problem is even if a child does have ADHD, the CDC shows that like almost two thirds of kids with ADHD have something else going on too. So we've, 
I mean, as a society, we've completely neglected that. So you start to treat ADHD and you're like, why is my child still misbehaving? Why are they still not doing well in school? Why are they still getting into trouble? Well, it's because they have something else going on too. So what didn't get addressed is maybe their learning disability or maybe they're depressed or they're traumatized or they're anxious. They have social anxiety, fill in the blank. Like there's something else going on. So that's the problem with only going to a pediatrician. It's, it's, it's like testing for one thing, but you needed to have the full evaluation to see like, here's 12 things that could be going on. Let's look at everything to really tease out how do we best help this child? So that's the, the pros and cons. Love it. I, I think that's really good. Getting more, more insight. Yeah. How, how common, like I'm, I'm going to think of like in percentages. Yeah. I, I'd love to just discuss this myth. How common is ADHD in general in the population? In the general population. So it, it affects millions and millions of kids each year. So, but there's also about last I checked, maybe around 74 million kids, right. In the U S. So, I mean, you're talking about depending on who's doing the data, it could be six, 8%. Some people say 5% somewhere around there. So, I mean, in the larger scheme, it's a smaller percentage, but it's still millions and millions of kids. So sure. it, but yeah, even, it really even, affects, even like yeah. Six to 8%, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to think of if we have an overdiagnosis pro, pro, uh, problem, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's not to me. It's never the ADHD, like getting a diagnosis that's that's an issue. It's more like yeah. the knock on effect of that. So that's sort of the opening of the floodgate, which leads into other different things. And yep. I, I remember from a conversation with Dr. Jenny Prohaska where we were talking about what's trauma, what's drama. Mm-hmm, right there's mm-hmm, and she mm-hmm. works with first responders so she works with yeah. people that are regularly in the you know in touch with death are regularly regularly jumping into dangerous situations so uh and it's always difficult to talk about this without getting canceled so please forgive me internet um you know like legitimate PTSD legitimate trauma versus you're not you don't have self regulating behaviors you don't have a way to manage your life you you're just you know and that and it can lead to it right like drama can lead to trauma if you if you're not able to do self care which is part of your specialty and and the reason why i wanted to get that number cuz you were saying like 68% or something like that 628 right it's like all right so that gives me a statistical odds that's like all right so odds are 1 in 10 my kid might have ADHD mm-hmm. <laughs> right and so um what about um so what would we do with that so we've got we we go through you know we we speak to a pediatrician make sure it's not something else um we we go to a specialist maybe for uh a, a, mm-hmm. a review some research uh, uh something like that mm-hmm. what, what's next so after that so after let's say this child got a comprehensive psychological evaluation, then you know first what's going on with them and then you put things in place. But the most important thing to think about is a team model, meaning it's not just things you're doing at home as a parent, but also it's things that the schools can do. So let's say a child did have ADHD. I have seen time and time again, like kids grade turn around, their behaviors turn around when when the school puts things in place called accommodations, which basically means they're modifying the way, well, in some cases their curriculum is, or they're modifying the way that they do certain work. Let's say they get extra time on tasks, they get extra time for homework or test quizzes or whatever it is, or they have a separate room for lesser distractions. Like there's certain things, or there's a lot more things, but there's, that's just a couple examples that the schools can put into place so mm-hmm. that this child can thrive and actually be on level hopefully school-wise, as compared to just not getting any services whatsoever. So the schools can put something in place, the parents can, and then, you know, maybe therapy needs involved or medication or whatever it is, but it is a team approach that's going to help this child best. What does that conversation look like from the feel-good father perspective to advocate for their kid in a school system? Yeah, great, great question. So, So essentially, once, you know, this parent has a report, then you take it to the school and you say, hey, you know, I need to set up a meeting, obviously, with a teacher as a start. It, it depends on the contact person, depending on the school, but you can start with a teacher and sit down with them and say, hey, we just got this comprehensive psychological evaluation. Here are the results. What is my next steps? Like, what do I need to do to put the appropriate uh, modifications or accommodations in place 
so that I can help my child. And usually what happens after that is there's a meeting with the academic team and you, and you, you discuss, like you say at home, here's what I'm seeing. Like they're struggling with their homework. They're taking two hours for something that could take 20 minutes, right? It's, it's so hard, you know, whatever is the case at home, you, you bring that conversation to the school. And then the school says, Hey, at school, we noticed they're taking longer than usual to get their tests done, or they're rushing through their tests because they're anxious or whatever it is, is the case. Like you have that conversation to say, here's what I'm seeing at home. Here's what I'm seeing at school. They put together a plan and hopefully start to implement that in the school. So you can see better results. Love it. So, um, that's great. So it sounds like a a collaboration, which is really good. Yeah. And who, I I mean, if there's a POC, is it the teacher? And by POC, I mean point of contact. Is that the teacher? Would it be the principal? Would we go superintendent? Like what level of the school? I I would start with the the teacher because depending on the school, there's, there's, there's there's actually different levels of contact, but I would, I would definitely start with the teacher because they'll say like, you know, Hey, I'm doing this right at this particular school, or it might be the guidance counselor. Usually there's some type of academic team, which is made up of a couple of people, but definitely start with the teacher. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. So now we're, we're in this world and I'd love Mm -hmm. to, to, we're in the world. We understand how to deal with it um, from a school perspective. Yeah. So what about age groups? Like what, are there any specific behavioral things that we should look out for, for different ages? Uh, You know, the feel good fatherhood, they they might be listening to, you know, they might have a one-year-old, they might have a 15 year old diagnosed, not diagnosed, all this kind of jazz. Um, (laughs) What, what are, are there different behaviors at different ages of our children? Yeah, usually for the younger crowd. So the, let's say elementary, well, preschool and elementary schoolers, you, there's different types of ADHD, but for the type of ADHD where you would see hyperactivity, you might see more acting out, you might see more getting out of their seat in the classroom or at home. They, if they're having a really difficult time sitting still and doing homework or some type of activities, or they're jumping to different activities. Those are some things to look out for. But again, it doesn't always mean it's ADHD, but there is an attention issue. Um, which could be caused by different things. When when it's in the older crowd, or I say the older crowd, but well, my high schoolers, right? When they're at the high school level, there still can be some more of the impulsivity type of behavior, which looks different because then you're talking about kids driving and making different types of decisions where they're thinking right. without acting. Um, but also as far as um, school, there might be more overwhelm with the amount of work because of course there's more work with high school. So there's definitely different things to be put into place, which is why I'm a huge advocate of starting early with this process. But the good news is, let's say you started in fourth grade for this child, you can uh, do like a reevaluation with the school so that they can change their needs. Because if they're in fourth grade versus seventh versus 10th, it's going to be very different things that they need. So you have another discussion like, okay, now they're older, let's change it up. What do they need? And the same thing at home right? You change up what you're, what you're doing at home. Got it. Okay. So we've got the children's side. Yeah. What are common, what are common sort of results or consequences for the father, for mom in this world? I, like we're kind of leaning now into the self-care. Yeah. You know, like what, what, what do you see typically? Yeah, typically. So I've seen, man, it's been 15 years. So I've seen really a range of reactions from parents who have children with ADHD or another mental health condition. Um, for some parents, honestly, it, and understandably, it's overwhelming. Like it is just like, I don't know what to do with this child or children and it's overwhelming and it's stressful. So I always encourage parents to make yourself your number one priority. I know that it sounds selfish, But the best thing you can do is to put some type of self-care plan into place to take care of yourself, especially when you're juggling like 50 million things, it feels like sometimes. So putting the self-care into place, even if it's only like 60 seconds a day, every single thing counts, right? So putting that into place though is going to be really, really important because again, there's, I've seen people who are angry about the diagnosis. I've seen people who were relieved and happy. They're like, finally, I know what's going on. I've seen people anxious, overwhelmed. Like there's just a large amount of emotions. Understandably, this is your child. 
Um, and it can change the dynamics of a family um, to learn about different mental health conditions and things that you need to do to advocate for this child, which is why it's really important to make sure the self-care is in place. Let's talk through some um, some examples of activities that they could do. Um, you know, we're, we're not about preaching the idyllic, right? Like most of us have just yeah. implements here and there. I, I know for me, it's like, we have this really great couch downstairs, like, and, and by downstairs, it's like our main space faces east. And so I see the sunrise every morning. Like that's I love that. a, a huge part of my routine I is I, that. I get in touch with the awe. I get in touch with the beauty of the sunrise, yeah. even on, even on overcast days, it's still quite beautiful watching the gray, brown and blacks, mm -hmm. not brown, the gray whites and blacks from yeah. the clouds, like come in on an overcast day and seeing, you know, seeing how the sun is or how the light is interacting with the sky. Yeah. Um, it just, it's really fun for me to marvel in that and be, you know, happy for God and creation, all that, all that, all the stuff. Yeah, that's <laughs> incredible. I love it. <laughs> and I do that every morning without fail. And that's just, yeah. that's like, you know, and that can be anywhere from 15 to 45. It just, you know, on the weekends, it's longer on the weekdays. It's good. It's been sun kissed. The sky has been sun kissed. Now I got to go have a shower. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. And I do that with my coffee. So that's kind of like part of my routine. And I, yeah. and I, you know, it's, it's like the pain myself first, but let's, you know, let, but my life is very different, right? I've constructed that specifically. What are, mm -hmm. what are some examples for, of different parents? And, and I fully acknowledge that the majority of folks, right, are, you know, they're in what I call a W-2, right? They're working for somebody else. or they're yep. probably getting up at six, getting out the door at 630, driving. Mm -hmm. I think the average commute is like 45 minutes, right? Driving 45 minutes to get into work for, I think that math puts them in at 745 right? For an eight to five day. Yeah. So, um, you know, what do you, what, what should, what should our, our, our parents, our feel good parents, what should they do? <laughs> yeah. So, so definitely carve out the time. And I know that it sounds difficult because it's like, oh my gosh, how can I add in like one other thing on a really stressful day, but it doesn't have to be a lot of time. So I'm glad you shared um, your, you know, beauty and awe with nature. I'm the same way. I love nature, sun, well, usually sunsets because I'm not a morning person, but mm -hmm. even though I'm not a morning person and I know many people who wake up like hour, like three, 4 AM, which is amazing. I don't personally do that because I'm not a morning person, but what I do decide to do, even if it's just five to 10 minutes of my morning is make sure that I'm intentional with my day. So I, I strongly encourage people to do your best to be intentional, whatever that means for you at the more, well, your morning time and nighttime. So in the morning, for example, for me personally, I have a devotional that I do. I have gratitude practice, all of this before I get to my cell phone, <laughs> because I used right. to wake up in the morning. And the first thing I did was grab my cell phone and check email and check social media and all these things. And I stopped that a couple years ago because that's just not how I wanted to start my day. So I encourage mm -hmm. people, one, to be intentional, uh, two, to know that it doesn't have to be hours and hours of self-care for it to matter to your brain. You start to train your brain with starting small. That's why I always advocate for like 60 seconds. You can time yourself. There's plenty of apps that have uh, meditation practices. I use them sometimes where you can hear like rain sounds or the sound of birds or, you know, whatever it is for you that's calming um, or looking at if you don't have the sunrise outside that you can see uh, every day from your window, you can, you know, create that. Of course, there's plenty of things that you can see online and watch. But again, just taking like taking those moments and trying to practice mindfulness, which just means you stay in the present moment. So I'm a tea drinker. That's my that's my thing. It takes me obviously a couple minutes to just make a cup of tea. But that like calming activity is something that can reset and recharge. So that's why I encourage people to do think about being intentional what can you do to reset, recharge and things that don't take a lot of time? That's I the found, to start. I found, I, I love that. So I found that in, in my research on sort of mindfulness practices, yeah. Uh, cause I, I, I kind of weave in and out of meditation, you know, mm -hmm. direct meditation. Yeah. But I found that one of the core things for mindfulness is being fully present on whatever the activity is. Yep. So if, if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is brush your teeth. Exactly. 
is to, you know, what, what would be the thing that I would have that person do? I would say, well, make sure that you can feel every mm-hmm. tooth, the toothbrush yep. passing every single tooth. And yeah. it's that, that focusing mechanism of having your brain focus on the activity, what you're doing, how it feels, not mm-hmm. thinking about anything else actually creates space in your yep. brain. It's, it's, sh- it's fantastic sure the way it works. Yeah, <laughs> so, it so sure does. It, and it's all these different pieces, right? You were you were saying the tea practice, and I was thinking of uh, I got into matcha relatively recently, oh, yeah. so it's like last year, kind of learning about the Japanese tea yep. practice. Uh huh. And they were saying one of the core things is that you that preparation ritual of prepping the kettle and and you know, for, for it's the powder and then you get a, uh, like kind of a filter and you crush it through. Yeah. Like it's almost like a, you're aerating. I, I used to cook when I was young, but you would aerate sort of the matcha by cr- pushing it through the filter and it makes mm-hmm. it fluffier. It makes it, so it creates it better. And then I used to have, um, I would do like a, a, a non-dairy creamer. So I had a frother. So yeah. I would create yeah. right, like a, <laughs> a, a milk foam and then I would yep. put like a little matcha latte in the morning and yep. and it was like, yeah, it was like five, five, 10 minutes, right? Uh, very different from the automatic coffee maker. You know, it was like we used to have for a while when we were a little bit more like, you know, coffee drinkers. And for those mm-hmm. watching, I just kind of did the pushing my uh, uh, glasses up, up my up my nose as a joke. But it was, mm-hmm. I used to have this pour over coffee machine. Mm-hmm. So it would be, we would fresh grind the beans. I'd put them into the carafe and the carafe, it was a Gevi, G-E-V-I. And it would basically like a pour over coffee, but it would take, it would basically take 10 minutes. Yeah. It was like a 10 minutes. So there was a mindfulness of just like, I could sit there and like lose myself mesmerizingly in, in the water and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I've been, I've been talking too much. So feel good fathers, please forgive me uh, for this piece, good. but let, let's get back to self-care. So we've got sort of what works for you and the small side let's talk about now it's kind of like okay what um when we're talking about these kind of practices what i think is really difficult for folks to understand is sort of and i really hate i I really dislike and hate defining an experience that's not really the purpose of it but what kind of results are we looking for so I have some I have some opinions on that of what we would want to see in the parent after a self care routine, and by that I mean after a protracted time, you know, like after a month, two, yeah. three months of doing a self care routine, what would we, what kind of emotional transformations are we seeing? What kind of overwhelm transformations are we looking for? How how can you know you're making progress when you mm-hmm. lift weights? you get stronger, you lift bigger weights. The Mm -hmm. feedback mechanism is built into the activity, right? Right. The fatigue you're, you might grow, you might shrink, right? There's, there's feedback mechanisms on the long term Mm -hmm. as long as you're doing it correctly of working out. What, what would the feedback mechanisms be for self-care? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot uh, of them depending on the reason that you're adding in more self-care to your life. So a lot of a lot of parents that I've met need help with feeling overwhelmed, with feeling depressed, with feeling anxious. Like those are pretty much the most common ones. There's a lot of ways to even measure yourself. I mean, if you're working with a mental health professional, they might have some objective forms for you to fill out and sort of look at on a scale of one to 10, how is your mood, right? How, I mean, if 10 was like the most depressed you've ever felt, zero is like you have no feelings of depression, where are you at? And you start to measure that the same thing with anxiety, the same thing with feeling overwhelmed, but that's also something you can do yourself, a check-in with yourself, right? So at the beginning of the month, let's say you're like, man, I'm at a, I'm at like a seven or eight. Like I am so overwhelmed. I can't handle it. Well, hopefully the goal is by the end of that month, by adding in the mindfulness, adding in the self-care, you're, it's not going to go to zero, but your seven or eight might become you know, a five or might become a four and you start to work on it over time. It's, it's not an overnight process by any means, but you start to work on it. And then the other, the, the second goal of self-care is for your, your brain at some point will, will get to the point where you say, okay, I know now how to reset and recharge. Like it, it becomes an automatic. 
So at first it's very conscious, like, oh, I got to add on my self-care day. I got to do this. And then it just becomes a part of who you are, which is the, mm-hmm. which is the long-term goal. It takes time, but that's the long-term goal. It's for your brain to be healthy, for you to be emotionally healthy. Okay. So let's say you're overwhelmed. Yeah. Like let's, def- I, I love these definitions, overwhelm, anxiety, depression. I love these because I think the, what, like when I, when I see these things, yeah. I don't necessarily see a static state. Like I don't mm-hmm. necessarily like a disorder. I see, well, these are things you can dip into and dip out to. Absolutely. So let's talk about overwhelm. What is overwhelm for a parent? Yeah. So, so parents will know, but when you're at the point sometimes where you just feel like you're losing your mind, like there's so much on your plate, the kids are driving you crazy. Work is just going crazy. You have so much to do on your plate and you feel like you can't manage it all. Like, which is a really common feeling, like feeling Mm -hmm. so overwhelmed. You're like, I don't know if I can get everything done. So this is a overwhelm is a tasking there's a lot of individual tasks yep and then a lot of and and i think the other thing was the competition for your attention oh for sure so you know when you when you're coming home especially with young kids right this is the oh yeah (laughs) bless all of us for young kids (laughs) yeah right they they're they require they have zero independence and they're a ball of positive energy love and attention Mm -hmm. um plus everything else correct (laughs) correct (laughs) so so okay so the overall parent they have challenges with all the different tasks. Their their brain is probably thinking about all the different things that they got to do. So yeah. they can't regulate. So so really, to me, when you're saying overwhelm, I'm saying what's the in-world version of that is that they're not able to focus on what's happening. Correct. They're at home. They should be in their safe space. They should be able to focus on their kids. They're probably thinking about work. Mm-hmm. They're probably, maybe another manifestation is that they're at work. They should be thinking about doing the work tasks, but they're thinking about being at home. Yep. So true. So common. Okay. So we've got the overwhelm. What would be one or two things? And let's, you know, like, let's do like maybe a self-care exercise. And then, you know, like, I don't know, what, what else would you, would you suggest or what else would you talk about with regards to, all right, you're overwhelmed. Do this, do these things. Yeah. So, so it's, it's training your brain to get back to a calming state, which is really important. If you, it's, it's really hard to do, but it can come with time. When you work on getting into the present moment, there literally is no stress when you're in the present moment. Mm. But most of us are spending our times focused on the future, very anxious on the future or depressed about the past. That's usually Mm. where our minds are at, which is why it's important to have some type of practice to get yourself into the, uh, to the present moment, which is what you mentioned before, which is a great example too. Even if it's brushing your teeth, for me, sometimes it's with washing dishes. Like we don't, we're, we're so, we're always thinking about something else. Like you said, you're at work, thinking about the kids, you're with the kids, thinking about work. But when you work on just having those moments to be present to what you are doing, something that you enjoy, something that brings you joy, your brain starts to learn, like, it's okay for me to calm down. You don't have to always be overwhelmed and anxious and depressed. Like you don't have, you don't have to live in that state necessarily when we start to train our brains to get into a calmer state. I think about when I think about this discussion, this particular part with overwhelm and your brain state and being present, I think a lot about spacing out. Yeah. And I think about, you know, when I was a kid, yeah, I, you know, farting around on the playground at recess or whatever. And then I, you know, go off in in my head and do my own thing for two or three minutes, like completely empty looking at the sky or looking at the trees or whatever. And then, you know, but I, I think about as an adult is like how rarely, if ever I space yeah, out, right. you know, there's always something going on. We need and more playtime. <laughs> there's I, actually adult you. playgrounds around, believe it or not. We, we, really? we need more playtime. Oh yeah. <laughs> they exist. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think of, yeah, I think of, um, I, I do think about getting back to, um, it's been, a, I, I've recently moved. And so I've lost my martial arts studio and I, that to me was a, it was a, that was a very calming self care yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, which is distinct. It's very distinct. Martial arts is very distinct from simply working out and lifting weights. Mm-hmm. So they're distinct exercises. Um, okay, so that's overwhelm. I, you know, I think if I was if I was going to give an example, it would be if you're overwhelmed by tasking with what you're doing, I would absolutely suggest that you just start writing things down that you need to do. Yeah. So that way, it's like that way, it's out of your head because 
you know, I, the way I look at it is that like, it's my brain di- dissecting everything that's happened today and saying like, oh, here's all the things you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Like, I do that organize- constantly. Brain dumps. I call it brain yeah. dumps. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've got taking, taking, uh, you know, a little, so part of the overwhelm thing is just as you develop the skill of mm-hmm. creating space for yourself and maybe staying present in the moment and maybe writing things down, what will happen is in those moments of overwhelm, it'll be a tool on the tool belt that you can call upon. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about anxiety. And so anxiety is something, you know, I actually have a handful of friends and I don't understand it. So I have had, uh, I have a a really good friend. uh, She's very dear and she has, she has crippling anxiety and I just don't understand it. And I, and I think that there's some things that we talk about and, and I try and I have to manage for me. So I would love like, what is anxiety? We're, We're talking about, you know, anxiety, what is it? Yeah. Anxiety, anxiety comes in many forms. There's actually multiple different type of disorders, but for the general person who may have anxiety, not necessarily anxiety disorder, it could come from something that actually happened in your life that triggered Mm -hmm. this anxiety. Or a lot of times our anxiety comes from anticipation of something that is likely to never, ever happen. Like Mm. there, there's, most things that people are worrying about in the research, they show most things that people are worrying about. There's like a 99% chance that it's not going to happen, (laughs) but our minds will tell us things that are not true. And then sadly we start to believe our thoughts because we're thinking them right. But it doesn't make it true just because you think something does not make it true. So this is like the, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Will Smith and one of his quotes during COVID, which I loved uh, because he showed up in my feed was, there's a very real difference between fear and danger. Correct. Right. You know, and so, and so this to me is like when you're saying anticipation and likely negative anticipation, because oh, I'm sure, sure excitement, like yeah. anticipation, you know, I'm, I'm curious. It was like anxiety, like I'm anxious to versus I'm excited to, they yeah. have the same energy signature. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I learned that when I was, when I played sports as a kid, you know, they were like, I, I was, you know, it was corrected, but I, it was really, it was really good. It was like, I'd be like, oh, I'm anxious to get on the ice because mm-hmm. I played hockey. Yeah. And they were like, no, you're, well, are you anxious or are you actually excited? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, cool. And so that, that kind of gets back to naming the emotion, right? It's, yeah. we're, we're talking about having that inventory of what's happening for us and what we're feeling. And everything's a signal based on something. Um, but I love this. So it's like fear versus danger. Yep anxiety versus excitement. Um, okay. So when we're, we're in the state we're we have a brain, the brain's doing its thing. It's mm-hmm. running wild, right? Cause we're in an anxious state. Um, I'm sure that if, if I was in an anxious state and somebody came to me and said, Hey, there's a 99% chance that that's not happening. I would very likely flick off that person. <laughs> <and be> like, <laughs> I'd be like, Thank you, person. Like, <laughs> go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what do we do? Because uh, I, I think that the, I think what we're driving to for the, for our feel good listener, mm-hmm. is that we have ultimate control. Yeah. You have ultimate control over what happens in your brain and your emotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, the, for me, this comes from the Stoic pra- practice: is that you get that response, right? Viktor Frankl, freedom is in the is in the time and the space. Yeah. between stimulus and response. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So we're anxious. We're anticipating something that 99% of the time won't happen. Mm-hmm. What, what do we do? So, so there's two ways to approach it. So anxiety comes in the form of our thoughts and our behaviors, sometimes both, or sometimes just one or the other. Uh, mm-hmm. So let's say it's thoughts and your thought is like, I'm going to fail at this particular thing. I'm a horrible dad. Nothing's going right. Like it's just a, a, string of negative thinking, you have to work on retraining your brain, at least to get back to the neutral point first, right? Like what are, but what are the great things about you? What are the good things about you? Besides the fact that these, all these things are going wrong, but what is going right, right? Like we have to retrain our brain on the thoughts, especially the things that we're telling ourselves, which is a process. I promise none of this is overnight, but when it comes to self-love and self-confidence and self-esteem, it is a retraining your brain on the thoughts, which are the things that are affecting anxiety. The other piece of it is the behavior side. 
uh, which are things you are doing. So even your physical body, when you're re- really anxious, sometimes your heart rate is going up, you're sweating, you're freaking out. I know some people have vomited because they're so anxious. Like all these things physically are happening in your body. So you have to do certain behaviors to try to physically calm your body down, which is, it could be meditation. It could be deep breathing. It could be, there's certain mental practices that you can do to calm, like get your body into a calmer state. I've worked with a ton of people that also have panic attacks and they have learned over time they learn over time like how to calm down their body so the re- anxiety can be reduced because otherwise anxiety can totally spiral out of control. And people are literally in the hospital in the ER for panic attacks, not heart attacks. They feel like they're having a heart attack, but it's because of anxiety because anxiety got so high that it physically affected their body in that way. So it's, we don't, we don't want it to get to that point, obviously. So it's learning the ways to calm your body down and your mind down when it comes to I'm- anxiety. I'm going to imagine that all that, you know, for anxiety for, or for each of these, that they're releasing a fair bit of cortisol. Into oh yeah. Your system. Oh yeah. For okay. sure. So can you tell us just a, a super quick, before we get to depression, a yeah. super quickly, like what is cortisol, you know, like, and I, like, I'm thinking from the perspective of the long-term negative impact of having a lot of cortisol in your system. Yeah. So, so cortisol is just a stress hormone essentially. Um, we've heard about it all the time because belly fat, all those things that we don't want. Right. But, But the good news is, and again, from a physiological standpoint, our body is releasing all sorts of chemicals all the time and neurotransmitters are doing their thing. But when we work on not having that happen, so with this stress, high level of stress, high level of anxiety, depression, all those things, negative chemicals get released in our body. But the positive is when we do the things to get us into the relaxation states, states of happiness, states of good feelings, we can control those those chemicals in our body and they become positive things. So let's mm-hmm. say we're happy, we give someone a hug, we have endorphins, we have feel good emotions that come up and our bodies also are releasing positive, healthy, right, chemicals into our bodies as well. So we actually can control that. And again, I'm telling you something really shortly that can be a three hour yeah. discussion, but we get to control that, which is exciting. Uh, but it, it really does take a mindset shift and taking some baby steps in order to make that start to happen. And this particularly followed the behavior side. And so, yeah, for sure, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not so much that you can like, ma- yeah. maybe you, there, there probably is a longer term you can think it into reality. Uh, but I, I don't want to discount the fact that this is all happening. And, and the, the one thing that I know is, uh, uh, I, I heard it on a separate podcast. It was actually on the, um, uh, diary of a CEO podcast. And they were talking about the impact of cortisol and how everybody around you, if you're stressed out, everybody around you um, also feels stress. So that's one of the, it's kind of one of the the pressures on leadership, right? So if you're a leader, Mm -hmm. your cortisol literally leaks out of your body and infects everybody. So if you're a feel good father or the feel good mother, your cortisol will impact your spouse and will impact your kids. Mm -hmm. And so they'll feel it. Um, But I, you know, like literally I remember they were like the simple, the simple best thing is to sweat it out that you can actually sweat out cortisol. So if you're hyper stressed, you can sweat it out, which I thought was like super cool. And so that can Mm -hmm. be go doing a workout or go having a bath. Yeah. You know, like, or like going to the sauna or going to steam room or, you know, just in in a place where you're sweat or go sit in the sun, you know, if you're in the South, (laughs) like it went super warm out in the summer, you know, do that. Like I thought, oh, that was really, that was a really interesting little hack of just, Mm -hmm. you can sweat this out and you want to, when you do that, you, uh, you want to like, you know, um, obviously get clean, change clothes, that kind of jazz. So, um, there's, I think there's a lot of wisdom in when you come home, you get out of your work clothing and you get into relaxation clothing. Mm -hmm. Um, aromatherapy anyways okay let's let's get back to um depression so this is our last our last big one right we had overwhelm yeah. anxiety and then depression i know that there is depression that is real and i know that there is depression which is a feeling can we can we paint the difference or is there a difference it's so depression is very it's it's tricky uh, because it is in the perspective of the person so Depression is an inner experience, uh, which makes it hard. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. 
And it's the same thing with thoughts. Well, there's different types of depression. So for some people, stereotypically, we hear of depression, like a person can't get out of bed and they're not doing anything. Maybe they're not going to work. They can't take care of their kids. But that's one form of depression. And then there's another form where people are up and they're functioning and they're going to work and taking care of their kids. But inside they are struggling. Like they are really dealing with some negative, dark thoughts. They're spiraling, again, mentally with the things that they're telling themselves constantly, not even aware sometimes of all the negative type of thinking, uh, which causes depression, uh, maybe losing weight, maybe having problems eating. Like there's there's a lot of things. And unfortunately, with our society, we because of the stigma of mental health, we don't always understand depression. So we're like, oh, what do they have to be depressed about? They're fine. They have a good job. They have family. They're good. And it's like, no, (laughs) this person is really struggling and feeling overwhelmed on the outside. Of course, social media shows, right? Like everything's fine, but they're, they're struggling. Um, and they're having a hard time dealing with their emotions and the things that are coming up. I think it's really, I I love that because we're, we're kind of talking about the stigma and I think uniquely for men, you know, in, especially for feel good fathers, right? There's, Um, you know, here's a little statistic that, that people don't understand. One in five men suffer from postpartum depression. We never talk about it enough. And is like, so this is a, this is a legit state. You know, we talk, Mm -hmm. and we talk a little bit about moms, you know, there's a lot of pressure on moms, especially for moms that have postpartum depression, um, to perform, right. There's a, just a a general lack of understanding by by society. But I think that's what we're talking about that when it comes to mental health issues, there's just a, a tremendous amount that is either misdiagnosed or ignored, you know, and you're, and you're bucking up. I was just watching, um, oh, I forget what it was called, uh, Mission to the Moon, I think it was, an Apple. Okay. And I'm in the second season, and the, court, the character Gordo is talking with Ed. Gordo had a mental break, you know, as a, so I, I have as well had a mental break. Um, he had a mental break when he was on the moon, and it just, his life just and it, like it was in the 60s, it was in the 70s, it was right around oh. the first moon, like the 60s and 70s. So mental health was not what it was. Oh, yeah, and, no. and, yeah. and part of what they're trying to do with the show is show historically yeah. what, what, you know, what things were like in that era. Mm-hmm. And there was definitely a buck up, stiff upper lip kind of, kind of element. Yeah. And uh, for that health and, you know, Ed just lays into him and a little bit calls him out, like a little bit calls them out of it, but it's, it's really fun. Cause it's not really until, um, well, I haven't actually seen the culmination of the journey yet of, of what yeah. he's going through, but he, he actually, uh, shares his journey with his sons. He has two sons mm-hmm. and they're very supportive. So there's, there's some good health there, but, um, even today, like when we take a look at stuff, there's a lot of, I always think of the consequence, right? Like if I'm just out there and I'm interacting with men and I see a mental health issue, Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, one of the statistics that I know, you know, it's like four X suicide, right? The end, the end point for undiagnosed and mistreated and not solved depression in men is that they kill themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Their suicide is at the end. And so I'm always like trying to think of it from an empathy, compassionate side of if I see something, say something, you know, if I see a bomb, I'm going to go tell the airport security, there's a bomb in the airport. If I see a dude that's got a bomb inside of him, I'm going to go, I'm going to try and reach out and just let him know that he's not alone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, from your perspective, what can we know about this stigma? Like, what can we know about, um, how to help each other as brothers and sisters on this earth? You honestly, you, you hit the nail on the head before, because that's not talked about enough. I, I, of course, I'm a strong advocate of mental health treatment that, you know, the therapy or medication or whatever that looks like very important. But also what we do in community with others and the empathy and the compassion and the kindness, like I can't even, it's hard to express how powerful that is. Um, That does save lives. I've talked to numerous people like one-on-one just hearing different stories and people that men, I would say that were at their darkest hour where they were literally about to take their life. And what saved them was that someone reached out to them in that, Mm -hmm. like literally in that moment, like it gives me chills every time I tell this, but they, they reached out like whatever, a text, a phone call or something, just like, Hey man, like, I'm just checking in on you. 
And in that moment, their brain was like, oh, wait, someone cares about me. Like, it literally saves lives. Like, we don't talk about this enough, but it's so important. There's such a stigma. There's there's millions and millions of people that are never going to go to therapy anyhow because of the stigma, because of you know, what all the, these different factors, the cost, what have you. So if we, though, as a community, like you said, can say, man, I see that you know, you look stressed out or how can I help or just the little things that you can do. It really goes a long way. And here's the other thing I always want to, to, for people to remember is that sometimes you're just planting a seed. Like there are angry people out there. Don't get me wrong. Like you could reach out like, Hey, I'm trying to help. They're like, I don't need any help from you. (laughs) You know what I mean? Or whatever, like a negative response, but just know that you're still planting a seed for them. Uh, Mm -hmm. So you, it, it really just does matter when you're checking in and you're showing kindness and you're being compassionate to others. If, if that person is open to receiving resources, you're like, Hey, I know a good you know, therapist or group or whatever it is they need. And they're open to that. Then you share that, but not everybody's open, which is okay. But the kindness that you show them that is planting a seed for this person. And I promise you, it is literally saving people's lives at this point. And I think that the, the positive side, right. Cause we're going to think about like this outreach is intervention, right? I think just on the positive side, reaching out to building a community and in general, just acting as a kind and compassionate person. Yeah. I, I believe we talk about neurochemicals. It releases serotonin yeah. in your, it does um, in your stream and serotonin itself is a huge, it's a huge positive feeling. Yes. Hormone. And so it, um, right. It, 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 it helps build more pathways in your brain. Mm-hmm. It helps you develop more compassion. I believe it leads to more calmness and leadership. The more serotonin you have in your system, the yep. calmer you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so these are all, and so when we're looking at it from the outward perspective, like when we think of the calm together, stand up father, right? Which is one of our goals, that peaceful, put together head of family, that kind of jazz, like that's a serotonin dude. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Doc, uh, thank you so much for the conversation. I think this has been, wow, we've, it's, it's been so ranging. Uh, if folks want to get a hold of you, I know that you've prepared a little thing for them. It's uh, at Dr. Nikisha Hammond.com slash toolkit. That's D R N E K E S H I A H A M M O N D.com slash toolkit, uh, to, to download these resources. This is really fantastic. But how could people, you know, what are you up to? How could people do some business with you? Um, give us a download. For sure. So yeah, definitely uh, reach out to the website, drnikishahammond.com. I'm also on Instagram, dr.hammond or Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, so definitely happy to connect with other people. I am super looking forward to right now, my new upcoming book here soon and just still working with different uh, professionals within the community and different, just the community itself, uh, talking to different organizations. So I'm super, super excited to connect. Excellent. Dr. Hammond, everybody. Thank you.